Okay, that sounds good. I yeah. like that with a drink in hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go on mute. Hi, everyone. Welcome to quarantine time. For those of you who are joining us today, what we're going to ask you to do is if you can hover your mouse towards the bottom of your screen, we're going to ask that you open up your participant list and ask that you open up your chat box. And if you could introduce yourselves in the chat box, we'd love to know who you are, where you're coming from today, and what grade you are in. And we're just going to give it a few moments to let everybody come on in and join us. But it's really helpful for our presenter to know, um, especially what grade you're in, because that helps with the conversation. But we'd love to know who you are, where you're coming from, what grade you're in. Again, just open up the chat box. You'll find the menu at the bottom of your screen. And if you could just type in that information, it is very helpful to us. Hi, Lily, thank you. So Lily's a senior from Essex. We have a parent of a high school junior, thank you. There's a lot more of you here, so let's have you introduce yourselves. We're gonna just give it a minute or two, allow everybody to come on in today. But tell us who you are and where you're from and what grade that what grade are you in? We have Regan from New Hampshire, who's a freshman. That's great. All right, I know you guys. If you can't find the chat box, just hover your mouse towards the bottom of your screen. You'll see a menu. Open up the chat box. You'll also probably want to open up the participant list because there is a raise your hand feature. So you might want to ask a question today. We'll go over that in a second. We have Luke from Montpelier, who's a junior, and Keenan from Tunbridge, a sophomore. Welcome, everyone. So keep introducing yourselves. We'd love to know everyone that is with us today. While you guys are checking yourselves in, again, we'd love to see everybody introduce themselves in the chat box. The slide on the screen um, is just a promotion. We have three more teen times coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're going to be having different guest presenters join us for each one of those sessions. They should be really interesting. Um, the one on the 28th, if you came to last week's Teen Time with Lindsay, um, even though we did talk about career exploration, this one on the 20th, 28th is completely different with a whole new way of sort of matching what your interests are with promising careers. So. I would highly recommend that you come back to that one. Um, and then we're switching things up and we're gonna be talking about how to get involved in environmental change, focusing on four programs that we have right here in Vermont that you can get involved in. And then the final session on the 12th is how to advocate for yourself. And we have a guest speaker who works with young people all over Vermont and, and does a really fun workshop on learning how to advocate for yourself. So with that, I appreciate everybody checking in. Um, let's just go over um, our protocols. Keep introducing yourselves in the chat box as I go over the, today's protocols. So what we're gonna ask you to do today is stay muted unless we unmute you. So you're gonna have to use the raise your hand feature if you would like to ask your question. Um, by asking it out loud, or you can use the chat box. We will ask that you use the chat box to share thoughts and questions with our speaker and with each other, but please be courteous and respectful. We don't want the chat box to become a distraction, so keep the chats related to today's topic. Um, and also, if um, just make sure there's no distractions going on on your screen. Try not to make silly faces. Make sure there's nothing distracting in your background. 
And if you um, are, are on an iPad or a phone, try to sit it down in one location. Don't be moving around your house because it ends up being distracting um, for other people. And for me, I get a little motion sickness. <laughs> so uh, try to stay in one place. Um, today's workshop about financial aid for your future plans is going to be really interesting. So just try to stay uh, engaged and participate fully. I know Lindsay has a lot of information to cover today. So we are going to get to that. I would like to introduce our guest presenter today. I'm going to read her bio for you to give her the full treatment of my professionalism here as I just pulled it up on my phone. So our guest presenter today, she's been presenting the last two weeks and this is the final session that Lindsay Carpenter will be with us. Lindsay is a outreach counselor with VSAC and she works with the Education Talent Search Program. That program is a trio program for students in grades seven through 12 who would be first in their family to attend college and from middle to low income backgrounds. The program helps students with career and college exploration and access. Lindsay herself participated in TRIO programs while she was in high school and credits them with her success. She currently lives in the Northeast Kingdom with her husband, two young boys, and a chocolate lab. We have not seen the boys or the chocolate lab at any of the sessions, but we always hope we might. But I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay right now um, and again, if you're just joining us, please introduce yourself in the chat box. But Lindsay, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, oh, hold on there. I got to share my screen. You'd think by now I would have figured this out, everyone, but learn, learning, learning curve. Okay. Can everyone, can you see this? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, hi everyone. Thanks for coming to the third uh, quarantine series where I'm the guest speaker. I'm pretty humbled to see some of the same people joining that tells me that, um, one, I'm not that terrible to listen to, so I appreciate that. Uh, but also, I know this information is really, um, it's information that can be overwhelming and it's uh, information that's also really useful. So I'm also really proud to see many of you here. Um, so this is, I'm, I, so typically VSAC does a workshop um, at almost every high school in Vermont titled Financial Aid and Managing College Costs. We do these in the spring. Um, so I'm doing sort of a variation of that today. And um, my first slide, if you joined us on the first uh, series on um, making a college list, this slide will look familiar to you. Uh, it's really just reiterating that when it comes to planning for college, communication is really important. And I'll briefly go over this again for those who might be joining us for the first time. But uh, your good college matches, in this case financially, are going to be, um, it'll be a great list if the student has communicated with the parent or guardian on you know, things like the cost of the college, um, other expenses that might come with going to that school. So for example, if a student is planning to attend a college in, you know, uh, the West Coast, like that's gonna require a plane ticket um, or a lot of gas. So having those communications about what that list looks like um, and the cost associated are really important. Um, and then same goes for family. I know money can be a really stressful thing to talk about, uh, but money when it comes to planning for college is important to talk about. There's many times that right now it's April 21st, 1st. So um, in a non-global pandemic world, the decision day is May 1, which is when students have to deposit at a college saying, this is the school I'm going to, here is um, some money anywhere from $100 to $500 to say, hold my spot, I'll be there in August. Um, so as long as, so sorry, I backtrack. So, you know, there's many times students 
haven't had that conversation yet with their parents of like, oh yeah, we got a $500 bill coming up in you know less than a week. Um, so the communication is really key when it comes to anything related to college, but really also with money. So I'm gonna get right into it uh, and talk to you about this advertised college price. Many, many times, uh, I think we've all heard that college is expensive and the sticker price of it is really expensive. You'll see here that we list um, five different options for you, all in Vermont. So sorry, our New Hampshire um, participant, not to uh, not include you, but focusing on Vermont here. Um, so this is assuming a full-time student, so taking at least 12 credits, living on campus, eating at the dining hall. I think um, we are also including what we call non-billable costs in this number. So that's books, uh, personal expenses. So if you need to you know, buy a mini fridge for your computer, I mean for your dorm room, I'm staring at a computer. Uh, if you need a new computer, so those sorts of things. So most expensive college sticker price for that one year is $70,000, all four years. If there's not um, a tuition increase, $280,000, a lot of money. Uh, and then we go UVM, 35,000. And again, this is in-state, so 35,000 for one year, all four years, and you can see it goes on. Um, so the advertised college price is very scary for families. Um, or, and students, and it's many times why students will say, I'm not going to college, I can't afford it. Well, then I will tell them, however, you're not going to pay the sticker price. You are going to pay the net price. And the net price is the cost of attendance. So the cost of attendance, I'm just gonna go back real quick. It's that one year, the 70,000. Um, so it's the cost of attendance, minus the gift aid you receive. And when we say gift aid, we mean grants and scholarships, money that you do not have to pay back, hence gift. Uh, and so that will equal the net price, what it is you as a family, as a student have to pay. Um, so if you remember uh, last week, I think I showed in the certain tools that, the, in the certain websites I went to, like College Scorecard, um, I think even College Navigator, you can look and see what the net price of a college will be based on your family's income bracket. You could go even further. Every college needs to provide a net price calculator. You could go to their website and you could uh, put in even more specifics, like your grade point average, your SATs, uh, some even say, tell us what you've done for extracurriculars, because what that will calculate is the amount of money they will give you, the student, in merit aid. So based on your grades, um, that's pretty much what you'll get your first year is merit aid. But moving forward, you might be able to apply for more scholarship money based on your, like your level of engagement. So... Going back, now we're going to compare the cost of attendance to a net price. So uh, again, this is um, assuming a student is going full time, uh, living and eating on campus. Um, so a family who is applying to the Vermont State Colleges, so Castleton, for example, and I'm also gonna say NVU in there because I'm having hope for them. Um, 24,500 might be this, the cost of attendance, but, if, but the net price based on the family information may, only, may be 15,000. And I don't mean to say only 15,000, that's still a lot of money, uh, but it's not that higher sticker price. And you'll notice that um, a most expensive college, so in Vermont, we're talking about Middlebury, um, that sticker price or that net price goes down substantially. And that's typically because schools like Middlebury, like Dartmouth, they have bigger endowments, so they're able to give more money in scholarships. Just a reminder of the tools that are out there so you could look up these colleges based on your interest, based on location, but also based on net price. The US Department of Education's College Scorecard, I would highly recommend that site. Uh, the College Navigator website is also um, useful, but I would use this one first. 
I'm not, I hadn't planned to go back and, um, and show you how it works, but I can at the end of the presentation if we have time. Um, this paying for college presentation is just full of a lot of meat, and so I don't want to miss any of it. But at the end, if you want me to show you how it works again, just type it in the chat box at the end during questions. Okay, so now we have a poll so that you don't have to hear me talk incessantly for an hour. Um, Lauren will pull up the poll, but the question is, which of the following best describes a type of financial aid for post-secondary study? And so when I say post-secondary study, I'm talking about um, any type of after high school college. So that certificate, two-year programs, trade school, four-year program. Okay, so I'm launching the poll. And when you see it, you can start taking it. If for some reason you don't see the poll, just type what you think your answer is in the chat box. So which of the following describes a type of financial aid for post-secondary study? Grants, loans, scholarships, work study, or all of the above? Looks like we have 10 of the 11 votes. So I, I commend the, the seven who went with all of the above um, and those of you who all participated. So grants, loans, scholarships, and work study are all fall under the financial aid umbrella. Um, let me end that. So, and that's what can be so, sort of tricky when, it, when you hear the term financial aid, some people associate it with just the, the, the FAFSA or just the Vermont grant or just loans. It's really the umbrella that has all of these items underneath it. And I will speak to some of them today. So types of financial aid, grants. So grants are free money. It's part of the gift aid. You do not have to pay that back. Um, typically, you will get grants either from the college that you're applying to or after you file the FAFSA, uh, if your family qualifies for need-based aid, so it's based off of your income and assets, then you would qualify for what's called the Pell Grant, and that's federal money that you do not pay back. Scholarships. So scholarships come in a variety. There's like two main types of scholarships. There's merit scholarships, so that's based off of your grades, which is why um, I encourage all my eighth through even 12th graders, always push yourself academically. Grades do equate to free money. Um, so merit, but then also another big one with scholarships is community service. You will typically always find more scholarship opportunities for community service hours, uh, community service involvement. So if you planned a really big community service event, um, a lot of money there. There are also scholarships for certain um, students in, who play sports or music, um, other sorts of talents and abilities, but merit and community involvement leadership are two of the biggest. And again, free money. So you don't pay it back. Sometimes you only have to apply for it once and then you'll get it you know, it depends. It might just be a one year, one type, um, you get it and it's over, or it might renew itself. So you don't have to um, reapply or you have to reapply. And those are things to consider uh, when you are looking at a financial aid offer from a college is just saying, okay, you see a scholarship on your letter that says, um, you know, college-based scholarship, a question to ask is, do I get this all four years or just this year because that could help determine whether or not that school is affordable for you. Work study. So work study is something you indicate on your FAFSA whether or not you'd like to be considered for it. Again it's typically for students who qualify for it based on need. Um, I tell every student when you're filing the FAFSA on that little question where it says do you want to be considered for work study click yes, because then you essentially have a chunk of money at the college you choose to go to available to you um, should you be 
uh, motivated enough to go and look for a work study job on campus. And Lindsay, this can I share a fun fact about work study? Sure. So when I was in college, I was a work study student. And here's a here's a tip. If you can get a work study job in the financial aid office, it's a really good thing because they know you and then the folks that work in financial aid will actually they can't do anything they can't do but they were able to learn more about my family situation and realize that i i actually qualified for more aid than what i was getting because we didn't tell the full story in our application and once they learned about it we actually got significantly more money so be up front and, and, and those work study jobs can actually benefit you even more. It's such a great point. Um, I wish I had gotten a, fin you know, a work study job in financial aid office or the gym because maybe I would have gone to the gym more. But the point is, is that uh, it's a great way to get involved with your campus. It's a great way to ne network. Um, it's really up to you to find that job that you want. And the school does a good job of, of letting you know, hey, these jobs are posted. If you want one, here's how you apply. Uh, and then it's up to you and your supervisor to arrange your hours. And it's called work study because it is there so that they understand you have, you're there for school first, um, and then you're there, you could do a job second. So, and then the other big thing to note is that it's money in your pocket. So that money doesn't go right to your bill. If it's something you want to go right to your bill that you owe the school, you have to arrange that yourself. And then the final uh, item under the umbrella of financial aid are loans. And I'll talk more about loans at the, towards the end of this presentation. Uh, but the biggest thing just to note here is that it's money that you pay back. So we have another poll, and this is why I didn't say what the letters FAFSA were earlier. Um, so what do the letters in FAFSA stand for? Federal Analysis for Student Aid, Free Application for Federal Student Aid, Free Application for Free Student Assistance, Free Additional Federal Supplemental Assistance. All right, the poll has been launched. Make your guess. If you, for some reason, don't see the poll, just type your answer in the chat box. And it's okay if you don't get it right. This is why we do polls, to test our knowledge. See what we don't know what we don't know. Couple more seconds, see if anyone else wants to guess. All right, I think we'll end it. It is free application for federal student aid. So congratulations to those who got that right. It's a tricky one. Um, you know, is it important to know exactly what it stands for? Kind of, because we don't want, um, we want people to know it's free. So believe it or not, there are, um, companies out there that will actually charge you to file the FAFSA for you, which is not necessary because that's one of the reset reasons VSAC exists. Um, whether you are in a VSAC outreach program or not, you can always access a VSAC counselor either in Winooski or by phone or at a local high school who could help you file these forms. Um, but it is free and it's for um, student assistance. So when do you apply? This application becomes available October 1 of every year. So if you are going to be a senior this coming academic year, you will file October 1, 2020. Um, and then the thing to note, and so those of you who are ninth graders, 10th graders, always just check this because the world of financial aid is so fluid and it can change pretty often from time to time. Um, but as of right now, when you file the FAFSA in October of 2020, you will use your tax income prior prior. So you will use 2018 taxes. Um, always make sure that you check college deadlines when it comes to the FAFSA. Some of you may have heard the like the saying first come first serve with the FAFSA. 
that's somewhat true. Um, colleges will use the FAFSA to help determine where those bigger scholarships are gonna go in terms of need that the family may have. So the sooner you can do it, it's just sort of like the quicker, not only do you have it done, and it can be somewhat a daunting thing to think about, but also it, the schools have your information and they know um, where to put you in terms of the type of money they're gonna offer you to attend their school. When you're filing the FAFSA, um, I'm not gonna go too in depth about what's on there. I can answer questions about that later on in the presentation, um, but it will uh, ask for you know parent income, uh, cash and savings. Um, they would like investments, uh, and I'll go a little bit more into that later not the house that you live in, um, not a, biz, a, a family business or a farm with less than 100 employees. I know those are sort of some of the important questions that people have. Um, and then it's also students where you're gonna list all the colleges you're gonna apply to. So that's really important um, because you kind of have to have somewhat of a college list when you're filing the FAFSA. You can always go in later and add more if you would like. So another poll, what other type of financial aid application might you have to fill out? The Vermont grant application, CSS profile form, scholarship applications, college financial aid applications, or loan applications? All right, the poll has been launched. Make your guess. What other type of financial aid application might you have to fill out? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop the poll there. Any one of those was correct. Um, the Vermont grant application is, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, I believe, but that is um, money from the Vermont legislature that students apply for through a MyVSEC account. Again, it's, it's based somewhat on need, but also the cost of the school you're gonna be attending. Uh, the CSS profile, this is, um, a, this is important to know whether or not your college requires it. It's typically required of schools who have those bigger endowments. Uh, it'll dig a little bit deeper into your, into your family's assets and income uh, because they, again, want to know where their scholarship money should be going based on need. Um, then there's scholarship applications, and I would highly encourage students to start that search now. You can never be uh, you can never do it too early, really, because there are scholarships for 10th graders, for 11th graders. Um, and if you go to our VSAC website, you'll see a whole list of scholarships that you can, um, or scholarship sites that you could look at. Some colleges have their own financial aid applications. Uh, so on, in addition to the FAFSA, they may have their own sort of um, CSS profile form. So it's always really important to go to their website and see what those deadlines are, what those requirements are, and always feel comfortable calling or emailing a financial aid office to ask them just so it's clear. And then loan applications, should your family need to take out a loan. Okay, so the Vermont grant application. Again, it opens October 1 of whatever year you will be applying for it. So those of you who will be a senior next year, you can start applying for that October 1 of 2020. Um, you always make sure that you're using the correct year because some students can still, like honestly, there are some students that could still apply for funding for this current year that they're in college. Um, so always making sure you're filling out the right application. I have had students had to fill it out twice. In order to be considered for any Vermont grant money, you have to complete it. Um, we always, again, suggest you complete it early and you can do it all online through your VSEC account. 
Uh, this is important to note on the right hand, lower right hand side of the screen, you'll say take the Vermont grant with you to in state and out of state colleges. As of right now, that is true. You can use the Vermont grant outside of Vermont. We hope to that we can continue this, um, but we can't guarantee it. So determining financial need, and this is kind of going back to what I was talking about with the FAFSA and what's, what's asked about on the FAFSA. When you file the FAFSA, um, you're essentially uh, putting in some information. So you're listing income, family income. Um, if families are divorced, it's going to be the family of whom the student lives with 51% of the time or contributes more financially to their, you know, daily cost of living. Assets, family size is uh, taken into account. Number of family members in college is also taken into account as well as the age of the older parent. Um, and so after you, after you put in all this information in the FAFSA, it will come back with an expected family contribution number. And this number is just a starting point to give families and colleges an idea of, of where they're at with what they might have to come up with to help pay to go to that particular school. But again, it's just a starting point. It's not actually what you have to pay. Um, so that's really important to note because sometimes families will see that number and they'll either completely freak out and just end it there and say, you're not going to college. Um, or they will, or sometimes it could be a little too low based on the types of colleges students are applying to. And when I say types of colleges, I mean sort of, and this is something that counselors know your guidance counselors should probably know is just those colleges that historically don't give great financial aid um, or huge scholarships. Okay, so I wanna document, I wanna go through a little uh, demonstration about how that most expensive college or even that middle college might not be out of range financially. So, um, so we're, this is looking at three different colleges in Vermont, um, again, full-time living and eating on campus, um, and this is the same student. So this same student has the expected family contribution. So based on what that is and the cost of the school, they'll get their Vermont grant. So you'll, you might notice that this student is getting a little bit more Vermont grant money based on the cost of their school. So then the next piece that comes in is the direct loans that are offered to students. And I will talk about that in a couple slides. So then after that, you're gonna get college aid. So you see here that, you know, this college that's most expensive was able to give substantially more college aid than some, than some of the other schools because they have more money to give. And so the remaining need or gap is actually about the same as the school that's $25,000. So we share this with families, with students, because the point is sort of, if you can get into these schools that are more expensive, you know, that's like, the, that's point, that's part A. Um, it's worth applying because it might not be the most expensive. Um, I hope that's clear. I'm wondering if I should stop and take questions. What do you think, Lauren? I feel like I've given a lot of information. Yeah, at this point, I mean, I don't see any questions in the chat box, okay. but why don't you guys um, raise your hand if you have a question or type one in? Um, because I mean, Lindsay did just give you a lot of information, a yeah. lot of really good information. So here's one. Um, I'm, I am a H4. Do you believe the information you will be talking about will be useful for me too? You So, Anna, you'll have to educate me. I don't know what an H4 is. Is H4, I, I think, Anna, I met you yesterday. Are you here as an exchange student? And do you want to get, on, do you want to speak?
So, um, an H4 is part of a visa process, which oh. means that my dad is working here, therefore I can study here. Yes, so you, in order, Anna, to apply for, for the FAFSA or Vermont grant, you do have to have um, either a um, permanent res, you have to have, uh, so you can file with a green card, but you do have to become a permanent resident. Okay. You, can, you can file with a green card, it's just far more complicated. Um, and I find that sometimes it makes more sense to apply as an international student. Mm -hmm. When, Anna, when are you going to, when, what year are you? Uh, right now I'm a junior. Okay. And I'm, I've been here for, I think, two years now. Okay. And what school do you go to? Uh, South Burlington High School. Okay. All right. I'm going to oh. connect. I'm going to connect you with the outreach counselor that serves there, okay? Because they'll be able to help you a little bit more than I could. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so we have another question. What do you think of um, college planners that offer a free one-hour review to assist with finding the best college fit for the student? That's a really good question. And I have to take out my own personal like feeling about that because I think if they're willing to give you a free hour and they're they're willing to give you some valuable information and not just hooks to like reel you in to come back and pay for more then maybe that's that's okay but that's again why VSEC exists is to help you be college planners whether you're in a VSEC outreach program or not it is all free. We are not. We don't charge you at all. Um, I get nervous about college planners because I, I work with first generation low income students. So I'm always looking to to help make sure that they're not taken advantage of. Um, and I think sometimes that could happen. Yeah. The response was, I think there must be a catch. <laughs> um, there is another question. How do you meet the remaining need gap? Great question. I'm gonna answer that next. So maybe I'll do that and then I can come back to questions. Okay, those are really all great questions. Um, and I wanna just, you know, validate that this is a tricky, this is tricky. It's tricky to know what to do, how to do it and how to pay for it and not go into debt. So, um, or huge debt. So how do you fill that gap? Um, so maximizing your financial aid is how we like to, to answer that. And so to do that is do well in school. And by that we mean as best you can get A's and B's, or if you're in proficiency-based school, the highest proficiency you can get. Um, challenge yourself. Take those dual enrollment classes when you are a junior in high school, if you're able to be successful in them. Um, because in that way, you're not only gaining college credit if you pass, so that could take off years you have to be in college, but also colleges see that on your transcript and they say, oh wow, this person is college ready. Um, they got an A in their dual enrollment class while managing other, other um, aspects of their life. Let's give them a little bit more merit aid. Increasing that school and school and community involvement so that you can position yourself well to apply for all the scholarships you can related to those. Um, going back to what Lauren was saying, in terms of if you can't get a work study job in a, in a financial aid office, communicate with those offices. Um, any special circumstances you cannot report on the FAFSA, call that office after a week of submitting and say, hey, just so you know, um, I filed my FAFSA, but since then, somebody's maybe been, has lost their job. It's going to be a big one this year with COVID-19. Um, or you have, um, so in, in my example, like my son, who's very young, but he has type 1 diabetes. So we have um, a lot of cost associated with that, that we don't report on the FAFSA. So we can tell the financial aid office, and they might give us a little bit more aid. Um, research and apply for scholarships. 
I tell my students all the time, you know, if you don't, not to encourage playing the lottery, but the saying is, if you don't play the lottery, you can't win. So if you don't research those scholarships, if you don't apply for them, you won't get them. Um, if your school uses Naviance or um, maybe PowerSchool has it, typically guidance counselors will list the scholarships available to students in your area or at your school. Uh, so just being aware and keeping up on, on those things is really helpful. Hey, Lindsay, a good question just came in on the chat. Do you know if good grades is viewed more favorably than taking higher level, more challenging classes where maybe you wouldn't get that A? So maybe you get a B in a more challenging class, but if you took that lesser class, you'd have an A. This is a really good question. Um, I tell my students, if you're absolutely positive you can get a B in that class, take that class. If you think you're going to get a C, don't take that class. If you think you're gonna get a B in that class, but it's going to impact all the other classes you're gonna take, don't take that class. So it is knowing a little bit about your strengths. Um, and so I then will advise my students, let's talk to the teacher who's gonna teach this next year um, and ask them what the workload is like so that you can have a general sense of, okay, can I go home and do an extra two hours of homework? Um, it's a great question. And I think if you are brave enough, if you can challenge yourself initially in the beginning, um, do that and then take stock of how it's going a week in, a week and a half in, and then be honest with yourself and say, okay, I think I'm not gonna be super successful in this class. I need to drop down one. Um, it's just, you know, communicating and being um, realistic. And can I add, would, th would that also then be, you'd want to think about it too, that if you had to put everything into that class and then all of a sudden you start dropping out of your extracurriculars, that would be a balance too, because I would think schools don't want to just see someone taking classes and nothing else. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Um, that is absolutely true. It, it, it's also just like if you can be really successful in algebra one and algebra two and pre-calc, that's great. That's college prep. Um, if you could push yourself in two areas of like in math and science um, or take that third or fourth year of Latin, it just shows that you have determination and grit uh, to get through it. So that's really important too. But yes, stay, you know, getting involved when you can is also important. So here are other ways to reduce costs. If there's no other questions, should I keep moving? Yeah, I'll keep going. Okay, so we say look farther. Um, if you were part of the Make the College List presentation, I did always suggest you have an in-state school on your list, but it's also really viable to look outside of, outside of Vermont or New Hampshire, wherever you're residing right now. Lots of students go to Canada to school. I have two students this year going to Canada to Bishop um, because it's just gonna be more affordable to them. You can't take your federal loan money to Canada right now, uh, but you could take your Vermont grant. So, and you can typically take most scholarships. So Canada's worth looking at. Um, in April, typically, there is a Canadian college fair at Burlington High School. So keep your eyes open for that in the coming years, not happening this year. Dual enrollment. So all Vermont students have access to two dual enrollment vouchers starting your junior year. Early college, that's available to your senior year, doing your uh, senior year of college, I mean, senior year of high school and freshman year of college in one year. So um, it's not entirely free. There's typically some, fees associated with it, as well as um, books. And if you choose to live on campus, those costs as well. But it's a substantial savings than what you would pay for one year of school outside of high school. Um, some students qualify for a Vermont grant to do early college. So we always encourage students to file the FAFSA and Vermont grant to see if you're eligible for that. Um, AP classes, that's another way to get some um, 
college credit if you choose to take the AP test and you get a certain score. But again, it could if you choose not to do that, but you still want to take that AP, it will look, um, it'll be, it'll make your transcript look stronger than if you were not um, taking any higher level classes. NEBI programs. This is um, one that I'm not sure many people are familiar with. NEBI stands for New England Board of Higher Education. And so it is for students who live within New England, so Maine, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Um, certain colleges will offer a discounted rate to students based on the program they choose to major in. So it's sort of confusing. So if I, I did that for graduate school. Oh, you did? Do you I did. To, do so it was really interesting. I was, um, I, I grew up in Maine. I went to college in Rhode Island, but then I was living in Massachusetts. And when I was looking for, at, for, at graduate school, uh, Vermont had the program I wanted. And it was really interesting if I was a Maine resident for whatever it wouldn't count but because i was a massachusetts resident and it saved me half the out-of-state tuition cost so substantial substantial savings yeah. so it is a really good thing to check out it is and you can go to the website i had it pulled up but i want to make sure i can get through all my slides um it's it's pretty self-explanatory if you google nebby or google tuition break um you can put in the state where you live and then all the programs come up that you could qualify for a tuition break for. Or you could say, I really want to major in animal science. You could put that you're a Vermont resident and you want to major in animal science and they'll tell you if there's any colleges that offer a tuition break. So it's, it's really, if you don't feel passionate about where you go to school one way or the other, it's really worth looking into. Um, and there's no special application you have to do currently. To get that tuition break it's typically noted on um, your application like oh this is a Vermont student who's applying for this program they're gonna get tuition break. Uh, start at a school that costs less and then transfer. There are so many uh, programs through community colleges where you can do your two years of what they call general education requirements while also taking some classes in your major and then transfer to um, a state school or university and finish out your degree, it is less expensive because community colleges cost less. Currently, uh, Community College of Vermont has something called direct admission. So they have worked with um, some of the Vermont state colleges to create these tracks, if you will, for certain programs. So you could go to CCV, any of the CCVs in Vermont, and start a two-year business program and then transfer into Castleton. And I'm business, I'm just using that as an example. I don't know that that's actually one of the programs, but then transfer into Castleton at the at the CCV rate. Um, so that's called CCV direct admissions. I'd highly check it out. Uh, community colleges in Maine are like my favorite right now because there's some great programs. Some of them fall on Nebby. Um, but they all have uh, sort of tracks with the bigger schools up there, like University of New England or University of uh, Maine. Um, and some of them have housing. So consider attending local and commuting. If your family's willing to let you stay living at home, that's probably the most cost effective. I wouldn't say it's as cost effective to live on your own and take classes, but that's unique to each individual. And then consider service. Um, milita some military service will cover some, if not all, of a portion of your post-secondary education. Um, so will serving in the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps. Many times those come with what's called educational awards, so money you can use for future schooling. So all um, viable ways to help reduce your costs and fill those gaps. So ways to pay, um, real quick past income, if you can save money now, it's a, it's a great thing to do. And we don't mean like hundreds of dollars a month, even $20 a, a month if you can to help pay for your books or to make that May 1 deposit. College saving plans um, are 
another way to help pay for college. Those are known as 529s. I know people are nervous to have those for when it comes for um, filing the FAFSA and getting financial aid, but they really don't weigh too heavily um, in when it comes to determining if you qualify for need-based aid. You can typically set up payment plans with colleges. It's just having that communication with them, some tax credits, scholarships, um, and then future income, parent plus loan. I'll talk briefly about that. Student loans, private loans, and other borrowing options that your family might arrange for you. I talked about uh, federal loans for dependent students. Um, these, all students qualify for these once they file the FAFSA. You won't get access to it until you do that. Um, it does not require that you have a co-signer and they are in your name, the student's name. So freshman year, you're offered 5,500, sophomore year, 6,500, and then junior and senior, 7,500 for a maximum, maximum amount of 27,000. You don't have to borrow, you don't have to pay this back until um, you graduate college and typically you get like a six month um, grace period. One of them accrues, they both accrue interest, uh, but one of them, the federal government will pay the interest for you while you're in school. The other one, they won't. Um, so this is just really helpful for those families where they couldn't co-sign on a loan um, and don't have access to outsource, outside support. Um, this allows students to, to have some loan money if they need it and you don't have to take it. Those loans are typically they are the lowest interest, they have the lowest interest rate. Um, so you'll see them on your financial aid letters as direct loans for students. That's the first line. Um, the second option is there is a Vermont Advantage student loan. So students can apply for this, but typically need a co-signer. Um, and then you could look for private loans through a bank if you chose. Um, those are options for students. Parents, there is the federal option, which is the Parent PLUS loan. Um, this one will sometimes be listed on a financial aid offer. It doesn't mean you have it. You still have to apply for it. Whereas the federal student loans for students, they do have it. Um, so it can be tricky. It's just when you get those letters, I'm not going to dive into them because we have ninth through 11th graders here call the financial aid offices, ask them to help you decipher that. Call VSEC, ask them to help you decipher that. That's what we're there for. Uh, VSEC also currently offers a parent loan and then again, other private loans um, that you may have access to. There are really helpful calculators out there. Um, Lauren, if you'd like, I can send you the links to these, but these are helpful when it comes to a student who says I'm gonna borrow you know, $100,000 for four years to go to college, but I'm gonna be a teacher. We can put all those numbers in and then see that their monthly payment's gonna have to be like, I don't know, $2,000. Um, and that is a lot of money to pay per month in a student loan. We advise never borrow more in four years than what you're going to make that first year you're out of college. So that we sort of use that as a guide. Um, but these are helpful to put things in perspective for you. I know I'm running out of time. Um, we have a lot of resources on the VSAC website. There are links, um, there's like PDFs on what to do junior year, uh, what to do each month. Um, same for senior year. I'll have that website up in a second for you to jot down if you would like. Um, here it is. So the vsac.org forward slash pay resources. You can find a lot of what I was talking about today um, on this website. So links to net price calculators, those loan um, graphs, uh, as well as the resources for junior year and senior planning. Uh, same with a paying for college guide, as well as um, just information on educational loans, where else you could look. These are all free resources, so never hesitate to go to VSAC's website and download them or request um, them to be mailed to you. However, nobody's in the office right now, so we're not doing mailings, but eventually we will. Um, and then we just, we do have a Facebook page uh, if you're so inclined. So a lot of info, I know. I'm gonna stop sharing. 
um, my screen because I know Lauren, you have some stuff. You yeah. Want to so um, what I'm going to ask while you guys are typing in your question or any questions you might have um, for Lindsay, can you just take a quick poll that I'm going to launch right now, just so we get some feedback. And if you can just let us know, um, we'd like to know if you learned anything by attending today. So just either I didn't learn anything, I learned one new thing, I learned a few new things, I learned some new things, or I learned a lot. If you could just give us that feedback, that'd be great. And then you can go type your questions into the chat box um, and we'll take your questions. I do want to remind you all that um, we have more sessions coming up with new guest presenters starting next week. Um, I think they're all going to be really interesting and engaging. So hopefully some of you will come back or you can share these out. Um, thank you all for taking the poll. I'm going to stop sharing now. And we will take questions. Um, I do see that there's one question. Does each state have their own equivalent to VSAC? No, unfortunately they don't. Um, but I do know that like there are some similar supports in um, New Hampshire. I just can't pull it off the top of my head right now. Um, hopefully guidance counselors at schools will have a, have a sense of who can help them with um, you know, co college access and financial aid planning. But I'm gonna, um, I'll type my email in the chat box for people to jot down if they wanna email me like those more specific questions and then I can do my research to figure out um, who that would be. Yeah, um, if anyone has any other questions while you're typing, I'm just gonna reiterate one point that Lindsay made about doing that calculator um, I was a financial aid recipient. I went to a very um, high profile private college. So there was a lot, as Lindsay was talking about, that school was able to provide a lot of, you know, gifts and financial aid of money that I didn't have to pay back, but then I did have to have some loans. Granted, this was a long time ago, so this isn't gonna sound like a lot, um, but at the time it was, I left school after four years owing $15,000. Now, my loan payments um, were only $125 a month, but this was like 30 years ago. I just aged myself. I worked for a nonprofit. $125 uh, literally left me scratching pennies together at the end of every month. So you really need to know what the average salary is for the kind of career you're going to want after college and, and really take stock to say, I know I want to be a teacher and a starting teacher makes, let's say, $25,000, $30,000. You know, you are not going to want to take out $100,000 in loans to get that education to be a teacher. It will strap you for the rest of your life. So you're really going to need to um, really make some decisions up front that are going to protect you on the back end because schooling is important, but going in debt for the rest of your life is, is not going to be the right decision. So, so think about what it is you want to do and then what is the appropriate loan amount to carry that will be able to be paid back um, with whatever career you decide to have. So that is just going to be my one piece of advice from someone who did go through financial aid and um, you know, benefited from that, from work study, from grants, from scholarships, um, but did have loans. Um, and you just need to make sure you do it correctly. Well, Lindsay, if there aren't, oh, so there is a question. What will the topic um, for the next meeting be? Yeah, I'll pull that slide back up. So, we have um, new guests starting next week. And so we have Kathy Tarami from Careers Click. 
who's going to be doing a workshop on how to match your interest with a promising career. And so it's really diving into helping you um, understand what are some of the promising careers here in Vermont and around the country and, and, and how to match what your interest. So it talks about career clusters. Um, one example might be you might want to be a game warden but recognizing that there aren't that many game warden jobs that open up at any one time. So what jobs in a career cluster might be similar to a game warden that you could then explore knowing that that's something you're interested in. So it's really trying to match what you think you want to do with a whole much bigger list than maybe the one career you might know about. So it's going to be really interesting. And then on May 5th, we're bringing in four different organizations to talk about um, youth environmental programs that they have and how they involve um, middle and high school students to actively do real world problem solving around environmental change. So learning about how, how you can get involved in those programs. And then on May 12th, we have um, Matt Wolf coming in to do a really engaging workshop on how to advocate for yourself. And advocacy for yourself can look, oh, it can look, the components are the same, but what you're advocating about will look very different from person to person, but the tools and the skill set you need is the same. So all three, I think, should be really interesting. So I hope that you all come back for those. Any other questions before we sign off for today? I wanna to thank you all for joining us. Um, I agree with Lindsay, I see a lot of names that were here at least in one, if not two sessions. So thank you all for joining us for these last few weeks and, and hopefully we'll see you again um, at next week's Teen Time. So enjoy and be safe and be healthy and we'll catch you later.